Okay, hello everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes. All right, thank you. So I believe it's 2 p.m. Central Time, so we'll start our Thursday session that is mostly devoted to lab work. But before we go into the lab work, we'll uh, revisit some of the theoretical concepts in relation to ERT programming that we covered last time. And we will also talk about some nuances of implementing uh, relationships among two or more entities at the database level, meaning at the level of tables. So after that short uh, uh, conceptual lecture, we'll start doing uh, hands-on exercises using Draw.io. Uh, this is the online diagramming tool that I recommend for creating ERD diagrams uh, for your uh, assignment three and all subsequent assignments. And overall, we'll get started on your assignment three. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's the agenda for today. Any questions, comments before we start with the formal agenda? Are you, are you all struggling with snow again? Uh, I got a few inches. Okay. Yeah, I think we got here like around four inches. Uh, it's a bit disappointing because uh, after that first wave, I cleaned uh, my driveway and I spent like maybe one or two hours doing that. And then my neighbor who has a tractor, he cleaned uh, our street. So actually yesterday I went to a store and I have a Honda Civic. It's not like a snow vehicle, a good vehicle for snow. So I, it was okay, but now it's all covered with, with snow again. So uh, I guess I will stay at home today. Maybe I'll go out tomorrow if they clean uh, some of the main roads. Okay, well, anyways, it looks like it happens here almost every year in the spring semester, right? We have this wave of snow, right? Yeah, it's usually in February from what I've seen. Yeah, well, I remember it's always like in the spring semester. So I guess it's uh, it's the new normal or, or the old normal for everybody. Well, anyways, uh, welcome back. So uh, let me share my screen with you. And again, if you, if, if you hear my voice and it doesn't seem to correspond with what you're seeing on the screen, please let me know. Sometimes I get lost in all those screens. So you see my Canvas page right now, right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll continue our introduction to database design ERD module. Uh, last time I gave you some background. Remember I showed you this business intelligence architecture diagram and I told you that we're talking about organizing data within data warehouses, data marts. We're talking about the so-called uh, star model approach to organizing data that is used for uh, business intelligence applications that are in their turn used by business intelligence users. So this is, our, uh, this is our PowerPoint deck that I'll be using. Uh, again, I would like to remind everybody, if you would like to revisit this lecture either now uh, uh, for the purposes of doing uh, assignment three or before the first exam, which, which will happen fairly soon, you know, it will happen in a couple of weeks, I will, I will tell you the exact date. So if you wanna revisit that lecture, I have a YouTube recording right here. So it's a more focused uh, lecture because, you know, when we're doing uh, Zoom, like we're, uh, you know, we're having discussions, like I answer questions, I ask you questions, you know, so it's not as focused, it's more interactive, but this lecture is very focused. It, it, it's probably uh, around one hour and within one hour, it delivers like this whole, this entire uh, ERD introduction to ERD lecture. So yeah, I, I would like to remind you about that. So I will be using this PowerPoint deck. So if you, if you wanna open it, you can open it and have it in front of you. So I would like to start from the very beginning. I would like to revisit some of the concepts that we discussed previously, and I'll be using this mode because uh, you know this presentation mode uh, it makes things a bit complicated for me in terms of uh, switching between screens. So I hope you can read. Can you read from the screen with this kind of uh, mode? Is it okay for most of you? Yeah. It's okay for me. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. So once again. Uh, Last time we started talking about data modeling and the specific approach to data modeling uh, that, we, uh, that we cover is called Entity Relationship Diagramming Method or ERD. I just say most of the time ERD, okay? ERD is a data model uh, utilizing several notations to depict data in terms of entities and relationships. So those are the two most important theoretical concepts uh, within uh, the ERD modeling approach uh, to, to data organization or data modeling. 
Uh, it is very important that everybody understands what we mean by an entity or relationship. We'll revisit those concepts in a minute. But again, please let me know if something doesn't make sense, if you would like to discuss something, uh, if you would like uh, me to explain something in a different way, because everybody needs to understand those concepts before we go into actual uh, creation of ERD models as a part of assignment uh, three and, and I think one uh, uh, additional assignment. So at the end of the day, we would like to build something like that, uh, something that looks like this diagram where those rectangles with rounded corners represent entities and those lines represent relationships, meaning some natural business associations that exist uh, between uh, or among entities. So let's revisit the concept of an entity. Last time uh, we said that an entity is something about which we need to store data. And people told me that this is a grammatically correct sentence and which uh, includes both, well, I'm sorry, uh, something includes both uh, things like objects, meaning, uh, meaning uh, tang tangible objects, intangible objects, and also people, right? So something means pretty much anything. So entity is something about which we need to store data. One important thing to remember is that entity is an abstract class or category, which means that if you're talking about an entity called student, you are not talking about specific student. You're not talking about a specific student. You're talking about uh, a class of people called student, right? So many specific students fall into that class. So with that, with that entity called student, we are organizing those observations related to specific students. We said that uh, an entity is usually named with a singular noun. So here the name is student, not students, not plural. This is just a convention, uh, not a big deal, but that's the convention that I think most people are following. Uh, although the entity is singular, it's called student. It can contain information about uh, many students. So we can have hundreds, thousands of students depending on the size of the university for which we're building an ERD model. So uh, eventually uh, at the technical or at the database level, every entity is represented as a table. So every, every, for every entity that you have in your ERD diagram, you will create a table like that, okay? So here we have an entity called student and you can see clearly here that this table stores information about specific students, okay? So an entity is a general category, right? And then specific students, which are represented by rows, represent specific instances or examples of that entity. So we have specific student named Betty Arnold, for example. She belongs to the general class of people called student, right? But uh, student is not a specific observation, it's just a category. And here we have specific observations in the form of rows, okay? Now, if rows represent individual students or in a more uh, theoretical sense, specific instances of the student entity, then what do columns represent? Okay, I forgot who doesn't mind being called on. Okay, I'll, I will call on Brandon. I think he doesn't mind. Brandon, can you hear us? Okay, he disappeared somewhere. Okay, what about Tucker? What's up? So what do, what do columns represent? If rows represent specific students, then what do columns represent? Just their like category. Um, well, entities represent categories, right? Categories of things of people. And then entities are depicted as tables. So within tables, rows are specific instances of that entity and columns are what? Any volunteers? They're the, the attributes. Yeah, they're the attributes or properties or characteristics of that specific entity, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think I told you that in database design, uh, an attribute is often called the field. I think that's the most common name that uh, database developers, database designers are using. They call it a field, okay? So uh, you're right, attribute is a descriptive property or characteristic of an entity, something that, a property that is relevant for business purposes. So here we have uh, an entity called student and we have all kinds of attributes, meaning properties characterizing that student. Uh, by the way, some of those attributes are compound attributes, which means they're complex. They consist of many parts. So one example of a compound attribute in this entity would be what? 
If Brendan got so scared with my question, he got somehow booted out from the Zoom room. Brendan, are you here now? Yeah, I am. My router just died. I just reconnected okay. on my phone's data. Because I asked you a question and you disappeared. I thought you got scared by that question. <laughs> no. So, so which attribute here is a compound attribute? In the um, student. In student compound. Didn't tell you. Uh, I'm trying to read them all real quick. Uh, Okay, any volunteers while Brendan is thinking? Uh, I, I guess I could go if you want me to. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, name. And, and why is that? Why is it a compound attribute? It's a compound attribute because it has uh, minor attributes uh, within it, like last name, first name, middle initial. Okay, okay, In, indeed. And, and the, uh, like the, the, visual, uh, the visual indication that are those dots, right? So those dots show that last name belongs to name, first name belongs to name, and middle initial belongs to name. It's like an hierarchy, right? So, so you're right, name is a complex or compound attribute because it contains many parts. Now, this concept will come in handy when we talk about associative entities. We'll, we'll mention them briefly today, but we'll talk about them in detail next Tuesday. So this whole idea of a compound key or compound attribute will come into play there. Okay, so some attributes are compound, they're complex, they consist of many parts. And we also, I'll go uh, briefly through those slides. We also mentioned that uh, uh, attributes, just like variables in any programming language can be of different data types, like numeric text uh, or string, long, long string or long text, date, time, yes or no, or Boolean predefined set, or even a media file, like an image, for example, okay? Uh, we also said that uh, attributes can have domain. Uh, a domain is basically uh, allowed values, a range of allowed values. So for example, if it's a number, then maybe you can say the domain is 10 through 99, if that number represents age, okay? I think nowadays, if you, if you go like to buy something from, I don't know, Amazon, and as a part of your customer profile, you need to specify age, I think they won't allow you to go like above 100, right? Something like, something like that. Like if you enter like, I don't know, 1899, they will tell you that's a wrong date. Although maybe, maybe there's somebody who was born in 1899 indeed. So those are allowed, uh, they, uh, allowed values, which, which is, uh, this concept is called the mean of an attribute. We also talked about default values, which means the value of an attribute that is uh, uh, selected by default, if nothing else is selected. So for example, if you're doing a survey among Murray State students, uh, you can add, you, and let's say you're asking them about the campus to which they belong, uh, by default, you can specify that they belong to the main campus. Right? Because most students, indeed, they come from the main campus. However, this is a, uh, this is a potentially uh, dangerous situation in terms of uh, potential, uh, 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 potential uh, data quality problems arising from that situation later on. For example, some students may overlook that default value. For example, they are actually from Paducah campus, but they will forget to change it from main campus to Paducah campus, or they may not care enough to change it. Right? So, so some data quality issues may arise if you enter default values. And I think uh, this concept of default, default values is uh, fading out of fashion. I don't see people or developers using it uh, that much anymore, okay? Another very important concept for, uh, for, our, uh, for our main uh, topic today, which is implementing relationships. We said that uh, every entity needs to have a primary key, okay? By primary key, from a practical standpoint, we mean uh, an attribute that assumes unique value for each entity instance, for each record, okay? So if we have an attribute that assumes unique value for each entity instance, for example, let's say we're talking about students, then, then out of all those attributes that the student can potentially have, we need to select an attribute that, that has a unique value for every student. And in that case, once we select the primary identifier, because we, we are selecting a unique uh, I, an attribute with unique values for every instance for the purposes of uniquely identifying every student or every instance. So once we find an attribute like that, we'll call it primary key or PK, okay? So naturally, I mean, it kind of seems intuitive, right? That in a database, we need to identify our records somehow. We need to uniquely identify them. And we said that uh, student number will work. That's what most universities are using. 
social security number might work, but somebody pointed out there are some problems with social security number. For example, international students may not have a social a valid social security number, so they will have to be assigned some kind of dummy value that is changed once they get social security number. And but I think the pro, the, the most important problem with using social security numbers for unique identification is not related to international students. It's related to privacy concerns because if somebody gets a hold of your name and social security number, uh, that can give uh, uh, that can increase chances of uh, the so-called identity theft crime, where people uh, steal your unique information and then they apply for a loan or do something else with it. So that's why uh, I would say uh, most, if not all, universities stopped using social security number for, uh, numbers for identifying students. So that's the, the idea for primary key. Now, there are some nuances, like there are alternate keys, uh, a candidate key that was not selected. There's a candidate key, one of a number of keys that may serve as a primary key. Uh, so I don't think those definitions are that important. You know, it's uh, you know, just something that you need to be aware of. And then there, there's another concept that is kind of related to this, uh, to this concept of a compound or complex attribute. Sometimes you have concatenated keys. A concatenated key is a compound attribute, which means that uh, uh, it, 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 is, it is a combination of several attributes, okay? So several attributes are used to uniquely identify a student, uh, a student or an instance of another entity. So those several attributes, they are joined uh, or connected together to form one unique identifier. That's the kind of logic our ancestors uh, used, I think, in the past. Did you know that last name is, the, the whole idea of having a last name is a fairly recent phenomenon. It's not that old of an idea, right? I don't know how many uh, centuries, but in, in, even in Europe, this whole idea of everybody having a last name is not that old. Probably we're talking about a few centuries ago where people didn't have last names, okay? Uh, I'm not a historian, so I may be speculating or making things up, but I think that, you know, uh, this, is, this is how it worked. I think in the old days, like if we're talking about, uh, I don't know, one, two, 3,000 years ago, if we're talking about Europe, maybe it was different in, in, in different culture. Uh, I think in Europe, people just had like nicknames, like tribal names. So for example, somebody will be called bear, right? Somebody will be called, I don't know, a horse or something like that, right? So those were like tribal names for identifying people. And then as population grew, they, our ancestors probably uh, came to this idea that, uh, well, first name, uh, having, a, having a nickname is not enough, right? So there are too many bears, too many horses, too many wolves walking around, right? So what do they think they started doing next once they realized that first name is not enough? And you can see it still, like you can see signs of that not only in, in European cultures, but I think cultures from across the globe. So when the first name was not enough, what did they add to your name? To oh, last name. name. Not really last name. I think at first the idea was to add like father's name, right? So they would start saying something like wolf, son, son of a bear to, to uniquely identify somebody uh, whose, whose name is wolf who comes from the family of bear, right? And by the way, you can still see it in some English last name. I think like, uh, you know, all those last name like Johnson, it means son of John, right? So eventually they, they started calling after father's name and then they kind of decided to formalize it uh, to, to create like a formal last name. And oftentimes that formal last name was actually the, the father's name, the ancestor's name, right? So now we still have middle name, uh, which is, uh, I think it, it's like an indication of that, of, that pro of that practice in the past by adding like parents name. Uh, the middle name is different in different cultures. Like for example, I know that in uh, Hispanic uh, cultures and Hispanic countries, their middle name can be mother's name. In my culture, which is like that Slavic Eastern European culture, uh, your middle name has to be your father's name. It's actually required by law. So when, when your legal name is assigned in your birth certificate, they will put your father's name, uh, father's name as your middle name. That, that was, that, that's a requirement, okay? So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that your last name, your first name and your middle initial is used as a concatenated key, which means a combination of several attributes that uniquely identify you, right? But of course, uh, using last name, first name, and middle initial as a unique identifier in database in databases or for other purposes is a bit problematic, right? Why is that? Why why can't we use like uh, let's say somebody's name comprised of last name, first name, and middle initial as a unique identifier? 
because uh, people may have the same last name. Yeah, not only people can have the same last name, they can also have the same middle name, right? So, so, so that con concatenated key called name will not be, uh, you, uh, will not uniquely identify every person, okay? Okay, so this is it when it comes to uh, uh, entities, uh, attributes, primary key, compound primary key or composite primary key. So now let's uh, uh, repeat what we said last time about relationships. A relationship among entities or between entities is a natural business association that exists between one, one or more entities. Uh, the important keywords here are natural business association. You see, in life, everything is connected to everything, right? But we need to think about that connection for business purposes. Do we need that connection for business purposes? Does it make sense for business purposes or not, right? So everything is connected to everything, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, two particular entities have to be connected. For example, uh, you know, it could be that uh, some of us right now, some of us in this class are actually relatives. So it could be that if you go, let's say 5,000 uh, years back in time, we have common ancestors, right? So we are related, we are relatives. But at the same time, we're not relatives for pragmatic purposes, right? I mean, we're not uh, relatives in a sense that we're not from the same house, like we don't uh, celebrate holidays together, right? So only uh, uh, relationships that matter uh, are depicted in an ERD diagram, the ones that are pronounced. Uh, we also said last time that relationships, uh, they are, uh, they're bidirectional, they go both ways, okay? So they go either this way or they go that way, okay? So by definition, a, a relationship is bidirectional. By the way, one important convention to remember is that when you're going this way, let's say from curriculum or major to students, the cardinality, which means the, the quantifiable, the numerical characteristic is on that side right here. If you're going from students to curriculum or major, then the, the cardinality is on this side, okay? And we, we quickly learned that so, the so-called Crowfoot notation uh, that was popularized or maybe even invented by Peter Chen, an American computer scientist. So he came up with the following notations. Uh, we said that one stick or two sticks means uh, one. There are some nuances, but we'll leave it for now. Uh, zero, uh, the circle or stick means zero or one, minimum zero, maximum one. This notation means minimum what? One. Yeah, minimum one, maximum many. We said that once it's more than one, let's say it's two, three, four, uh, 17, 7,000, 5 million, we just say many, okay? And here it's uh, minimum zero, maximum many, and this is just many, okay? So this is the so-called Crowfoot notation. Now, this is how it's represented uh, on a diagram. If we're going from students to majors, we're saying we are, we're looking at this cardinality sign. So a student can have uh, a minimum of one major or curriculum of study. Again, it depends on the university. In some universities, like Murray State, you can be undeclared. So you'll, you'll have zero here instead of a stick. In other universities, they actually require you. Hey, Casey, you're polluting uh, my broadcast with music. Sorry, sir. Uh, Hi, hey, oh, no I, I, thought this, I thought the ringer was off. Okay. Well, I, I think you, like if, if you're not planning to talk in the nearest uh, time, you can just keep, keep your mic on mute to avoid situations like that. Okay, so, so we said that one student, so if I'm going from students to majors or from students to curriculum, uh, one student uh, at the minimum can be enrolled in one major, at the maximum he or she can have many majors. For example, a student can be double or triple major. Once it's more than one, we just say many. If we are going this way, uh, a curriculum, uh, a curriculum can be uh, or major can be populated or taken or, or declared at the minimum by zero students. So let's say it's a new major, no students have signed up for it, and the maximum is many students. So it's going that way. So this is how cardinality is interpreted by looking on the opposite side, depending. Uh, which direction of the relationship you are trying to explain or quantify with the cardinality. Okay, now uh, let's, uh, let's look at some concepts that are, uh, uh, I mean, they're fairly minor, they're just like some smaller comments, and, but we'll zoom, zoom on those concepts a bit later. 
first of all, uh, let's talk about the degree uh, of the relationship. So, so degree of the relationship refers to the number of entities that participate in the relationships. Uh, some relationships are binary, right? Some relationships are binary, meaning there are two entities participating in that relationship. But sometimes you can have, let's say, three entities. And in, in that case, it, they will, this relationship will be called ternary relationships. So ternary, uh, 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 this word stems from the word three, right? Sometimes a relationship can be between uh, different instances of the same entity. So basically an entity is related to itself. So in that case, it's a recursive relationship, just like the, co the concept of a recursive function in programming, right? So a recursive function in programming does what? What does recursion mean in programming? To back up or repeat. Yeah, it's related to repetition, but it's something more specific than that. Okay, who is computer science major here? Okay, Casey. Yes, sir. So what is a recursive function in programming? Uh, I, I've completely forgotten what it is at the moment. Okay, but you covered that, right? Okay, sure. let's ask uh, Harrison. I know he's a computer science major. Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? The question is, what is a recursive function in programming? Somebody's answering in chat. Oh, Jessica yeah. said, it calls back calls on, on itself. itself yeah, it's a bit like, a, kind of, it takes a while to wrap your brain around, but what happens is that a function ac accepts itself as, as its argument, right? And that reminds me, uh, when, uh, when I was an undergraduate student, I was first ma majoring in computer engineering. And we had this big lecture class called Intro to Computer Science or Computer Science 101, something like that. So we had all kinds of majors sitting there. And I remember it was like the first semester for, for like you know, freshman students. And I remember in that class, we had like 150 students sitting there and everybody was happy. Everybody likes programming. Everybody likes computers. And then the lecturer started explaining recursion when the function calls itself. And that blew minds of so many people. I mean, after that lecture, I saw people dropping out, like towards the end of the semester, uh, after 150, you know, instead of 150, we had like 100 students left, right? So people, once we got into recursion, people were like, wow, that's not for me. I mean, I like, yeah, I like video games. I like browsing internet, but uh, I don't want to study this, right? So, so recursion blew the minds of a lot of uh, students in that class. Okay, so, so yeah, uh, uh, an entity can, can be con uh, instances of an entity can be connected to other instances within the same entity. And in that case, it's called the recursive relationship. So here you have uh, 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 an example of a, a relationship that is Ennery. Ennery stands for many, I guess, right? So now we have not a ternary because we have four entities connected together, okay? By the way, the entity here in the middle, it's called associative entity, okay? And associative entity is, is created for the sole purpose of connecting several entities together, okay? So for example, this entity called assignment, it connects together data about projects, employees, and locations. The reason you can tell that this is an associative entity, first of all, you have this uh, rhombus, right? Although we're not gonna use this rhombus in our ERD models, but look, uh, assignment ID, which is the primary key or unique identifier for that assignment entity, uh, contains how many parts? How many parts do we see to assignment ID? Three. Yeah, three parts, project number, employee ID, and location number. By the way, each of those three parts is a primary key of, the, of one of the entities that this associative entity is connecting, right? So for example, project number is the primary key of this entity. Employee ID is a primary key of this entity called employee. And location number is the primary key of the location entity. So an associative entity, again, by definition, has a compound primary key. Its primary key consists of several prime, of, of uh, two or more primary keys of the entities that is connecting together. And we'll talk more about this idea of using associative entities for connecting together several entities because we will use that concept for resolving many-to-many -many or non-specific relationships. So for now, just keep in mind there are associative entities that have compound primary keys that connect 
uh, two or more entities together. In fact, they're created for the, for, for the sole purpose of, of doing that, right? And I think at the database level, when people develop tables, it's called like a join table, which means that uh, uh, it's a table for joining other tables together, right? So that's what an associative entity represents, a join table. Okay, so, so now we're gonna get uh, uh, to another concept that is very important to understand. Again, let me know if, if I can explain this concept in a different way, uh, from a different angle, if things seem to be unclear, because you, you need to understand that concept for creating ARD models and also for uh, completing uh, your assignment three. So let's start with, with, with definitions, if you don't mind. Uh, we talked about primary keys, right? So, so we understand that the primary key is a unique identifier that is used to, to uniquely identify instances of a particular entity. Now, there is also a related concept called foreign key. So a foreign key is a primary key of an entity that is used in another entity to identify instances of a relationship, okay? Again, uh, maybe this def definition sounds a bit too esoteric, too complicated. So let me make a couple of, of, of points or, or try to rephrase it in a simple way. The first thing I would like to say is that foreign, uh, foreign keys are used for connecting entities together. That's, that's the first point I would like to make. In other words, foreign keys are used to implement relationships at the database level. So remember here, we have a relationship, like students are, are connected to majors. The question becomes, how do we indicate at the table level, at the database level, at the technical level, that these two are related? Well, the answer is through foreign keys, okay? We do that through foreign keys. This is how we do it. We take a primary key from one entity Oh, let's let's let me point to this one because it will be I think slightly more intuitive. So how do we implement this relationship? We take a primary key from curriculum or major, and we insert it as an attribute to the student table, or student entity. So in that case, you will have the following additional column. Remember, this is the table that represents students, right? So for Betty Arnold, you'll create another column called major, and you will insert, let's say. Uh, computer information systems, if it's the primary key of that entity called curriculum, as one of the attributes, right? So once you take a primary key from one entity and insert it into another entity, it becomes a foreign key. Foreign key means a key that is a foreigner, meaning not from this entity, just like a foreigner means not from this country, right? Somebody not from this country. So a foreign key is a primary key of one entity inserted into another entity, okay? So that's what we mean by foreign key. Does this make sense? Yes. So a foreign key is a primary key of another entity inserted into this particular entity for the purposes of indicating the connection or relationship, okay? Now the question becomes, how do you know which primary key to insert where? In other words, look, look at this situation right here. Should we take primary key from the curriculum and insert it into the student, or should we take the primary key from student and insert it into the curriculum? And in that case, student ID will be the foreign key of the curriculum entity, okay? So which, which, uh, uh, which way do we go about this, okay? As it turns out, there is a rule. And the rule is this. In a one-to-many relationship where you have one uh, on one side and many on another side, one entity is a parent entity and the, and the other one is a child entity, okay? Now, how do we know which entity is a parent or child entity? Well, just remember this uh, definition. The child is always on the many side. The child is always on the many side, okay? So if we know that an entity is a child, right? Then we take the primary key from the parent entity and insert it into the child entity, okay? We insert it into the child entity. So, so that's, uh, uh, that, that's the rule. Now, why we don't do it uh, the opposite way? Uh, I think it's clear to see why, 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 we don't, why don't we take a, a, an entity uh, uh, from uh, a, prim a primary key from the, from the child entity and insert it into parent entity? Well, a short answer is that it wouldn't make sense because it will violate the integrity of tables of your of your table design. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at the following example. 
So here we have uh, two tables or two entities, okay? One entity is called what? Based on the information that you see, how would you call it? So this table represents what? What kind of class of people? Students. Students, right? And this entity represents dorms, okay? Now, let me ask you this. Is there a relationship between students and dorms, like a natural business association that is relevant for, for the purposes of running a university? Yes. So what's the relationship between students and dorms? Uh, students live in dorms. Yeah, student, li student lives in dorms. And if you're going the opposite way, you can say that uh, dorms are populated by students, okay? Now, I will use, uh, 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 let me use, maybe I'll just use paint to make it less complicated. Now, let me use a, a diagram called, um, let me think. Okay, yeah, let me use a tool called Draw.io. I mean, if you have, uh, if you have time, you, uh, if you have an opportunity, you can follow what I'm doing, but I'll just create a very quick sketch. Uh, so just type Draw.io and it will open something like that. By the way, that's, that's what sucks about web tools. Like everything changes. Like, you know, last time I visited it was draw.io. Now it's called diagrams.net. So I guess the name is different now. And then the interface has changed slightly. So you can open that tool by entering draw.io or I guess diagrams.net. Well, I guess it's something. In okay, let me just enter draw.io. So were you able to open a screen like that? You see something like this? Yep. Yes. Okay, so then select uh, create new diagram and then you can name it anything you want. You can save it on your hard drive if you want to, but I'll just select blank diagram. I encourage you to explore the kind of diagrams that can be cre created for, uh, with Draw.io uh, this is a free web-based, uh, cloud-based equivalent to Microsoft Visio. I know that some people or a lot of people still prefer Microsoft Visio. I've been having so many troubles with Visio with its compatibility with my uh, current office installation. So a long time ago, I switched to Draw.io and I'm using it for creating all of my diagrams for articles, for PowerPoints, for, for, mo for uh, uh, most of the cases when I need some kind of visual uh, depiction, okay? So I'll select a blank diagram. I'll just you know, click here and it's selected by default and I click create uh, one. You just need to name it somehow. So I'll just name it. Uh, let's say ERD practice. Is two because I already have a file there. So I'll use this uh, tool just to create a quick sketch. So we'll practice together creating a sketch uh, of a very simple ERD diagram. So to create a sketch, you need to go to entity relationships tab right here. So here you have all the notations that you need to create a, an ERD diagram. We're, gonna, we're not gonna be using most of those notations because they go into the nuances of ERD modeling that we don't need for, for the purposes of this class. So one element that we will definitely need is the entity uh, 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 depiction right here. So uh, remember, we're talking about uh, students and dorms, right? So we need two entities. So what I will do, I'll just click, left click here and drop it on the canvas. And I will name it student, okay? Are you able to follow? Yes. Okay, good. Let, let me know if you get stuck, we'll wait a little bit and we'll try to to get you unstuck. And then uh, let, let's, let us quickly enter those attributes. Uh, by the way, I'm not gonna be that strict about notation. Uh, uh, there, is, uh, there are like a series of standards like UML standards for creating ERD diagram, diagrams. As long as, you're, you're, if you're, as long as you're doing something that kind of looks similar to, to what you see on slides, because there are many diagramming tools and they use like slightly different, different, different visual representations. So I'm not gonna be that strict as long as I can understand your diagram what's happening there. So let's enter, uh, let's enter the three attributes for students. Student ID, last name and first name. So we'll simplify things. We'll pretend that uh, name is not a compound attribute and those are separate attributes. So 
uh, student, uh, student ID, last name, and first name. So we're gonna enter it right here. And the way you enter it is by double clicking and editing those attributes. So we'll have student ID as our primary key. And then we'll enter student first name. By the way, this is how I name attributes in databases. I use capitalization to kind of visually separate uh, words. Uh, please uh, try not to use uh, blank spaces. Although a, a database uh, management system such as Microsoft Access, it can accommodate attributes, uh, names that have space, uh, things become a bit confusing because you'll have to use square brackets to indicate that it's one single attribute. Some people forget about that and that leads to uh, errors uh, in the database that people uh, uh, you know, uh, that people cannot spot immediately. And I'm not gonna put plus sign because I'm not used to it. So I'll just delete it. Okay, so this is our student entity. And the second entity that we have is a dorm entity. I duplicated attributes by double clicking. So I double click on the name, I put dorm here. And let's see what kind of attributes we have. We have a dorm and residence director as two attributes. Okay. By the way, dorm name, maybe the be uh, a better name for this will be dorm name. Okay, so this will be our primary key. Now, usually using a uh, name of uh, somebody or something is not a good idea because uh, names can be duplicated. But I think in the case of dorms, it makes sense, right? I mean, I cannot imagine a university that has dorms with the same name, right? Well, actually, uh, let me think about it. I guess there could be a situation where somebody builds two dorms. Well, anyways, I don't think it's an issue for most universities. So let's use, uh, just like in this example, dorm name is the primary key. Now, somebody already told us that uh, students are related to dorms because students live in dorms and dorms are populated by students, right? So there is a relationship, okay? Now let's think about uh, cardinality of that relationship. If we're going to students, from students to dorms, so we're talking about this side, this cardinality notation, at the minimum, a student can live in how many dorms at the minimum? Well, I guess technically yeah. zero. So, so zero, right? Yes. Because uh, not everybody, not every student lives in a dorm. So a student can live in zero dorms in the sense that he or she does not live in a dorm, right? So the minimum is zero. What's the maximum? One. One. Uh, I, well, I, mean, I guess I could transfer dorms from different years. But if you're talking about one semester, then one. Yeah, so most likely it's one. I may, yeah, I understand your, your clarification that some students may live in several dorms throughout their studies, but I guess the assumption here, we're making a simplifying assumption that we only care about this, where a student lives now, right? So, yes. so a student can live in zero or, or one dorms, so the cardinality is zero or stick. If we're going this way, a dorm can be associated at the minimum with how many students? However many attend the university? No, at the minimum. Zero. Oh, yeah, zero. I would say zero, right? Let's say it's a new dorm or it's a dorm uh, between semesters. I know that semesters kind of, uh, uh, during semester, uh, after semester is over, I think dorms, they kind of boot out students, right? Do they ask them to leave or how right. does it work? Yeah, if you need to stay on campus, I think there's two dedicated dorms that'll house you, but you have to still pay and, and stuff. But the, uh, most dorms you have to clear out of. Yeah, so you cannot sign up like for one year or two years, right? It's only one semester at a time. Right. Okay, so I think it kind of makes sense for us to say that a dorm is associated at the, at, at the minimum with zero students. And what's the maximum? Many. Many, right. So, okay, so now we'll figure out the cardinality. So what needs to be done? You need to find a line that corresponds to, to the cardinalities that we have just discussed. So it's zero or one here, because uh, I cannot imagine a student that lives in two dorms. And here we have zero many. So let me quickly find one. I think we need this one. So I'll drop it here and then I'll just rotate it. 
So one, you see like there's, there are connecting points. Like once you hover over the connecting line, it will turn to green, it will be a green spot. So you just drop it here and then you drag it here to the connecting point here. So here you go. I'm sorry, it's a wrong one, right? We, we have zero many, sorry, I selected the wrong one. So zero one, zero many. Okay, so we need this one, right? So a student can live in zero or one dorms while a dorm can be populated by zero many students. So that's the connecting line. So I'll straighten it out a little bit. Okay, so look, now we have two entities and those, uh, these two entities are connected with the relationship line with correctly specified cardinality. Now, remember, we need to implement this relationship at the technical or database level, okay? For that, we need to take a, a primary key from one entity and insert it as a foreign key into another entity, okay? So my question to you, given the rule that we have just discussed, uh, out of these two entities, which, which of the following is a child entity? Student. Okay, it's student indeed. Why? Because it has the many side of the cardinality relationship. Yeah, because because it's on the many side. So here we have many. Here we have one. Right now, you may ask me like, what if we have uh, too many relationships? So which one? In that case, I will I will just tell you briefly that, is that if you have a situation where many is on both sides, in that case, uh, in that in that case. Uh, uh, you need to resolve it. You know, this type of relationship considered to be a bad practice to have on your ERD diagram, right? So it should always be one to many relationship. So, so once again, student is on the many side, right? Student is on the many side and then dorm is on the one side. So dorm is a parent entity while student is a child entity. So we'll mark them as such. Okay, so once we know which entity is parent entity and which entity is a child entity, we take primary key from which entity? Dorm. From the dorm, from the parent entity and insert it as the foreign key into the child entity to indicate the relationship, right? And then uh, according to the definition, once the primary key from, uh, from dorm is inserted into the student entity, it becomes a foreign key, okay? So, so that's, uh, that, that's the rule. Now you may ask me like, why we're doing it this way? Why don't we take a, a, for, a primary key from the student entity and insert it into the dorm entity? Well, a short answer is that if we do it like that, it will violate the integrity of the design of the database. So let's take a look at the database level. So this is how it works. When you follow the rules, you, you take primary key from the dorm entity and insert it in the student entity. For example, if Betty moves into the Smith dorm, we insert Smith here in that column called dorm, right? But look what's gonna happen if we do it in the, in the, in the opposite way. We, we, let's say Betty moves to dorm, to a dorm uh, called Smith with the name Smith. So what we will do, we'll take her ID, let's say, and insert it here. So here we're gonna have a column called, let's say student. Right, and here we're going to have two one forty four to indicate that uh, Betty lives in Smith dorm. Sounds okay for now, but what will happen if somebody else moves into this dorm, such as Lisa? What what do we need to do now? We need to create a fourth column, and that column will will we call something like student two, and it will have um, three eight forty three as a foreign as a value of the foreign key. So you see what happens. Every time uh, a student moves to a dorm, we change the dimensions of the table. We change the design of the table, right? So it's not a good practice versus here, we just have one column and we just populate this column with values if students move to dorms, right? So this is why you take the primary key from the parent entity and insert it into the child entity, okay? So that's why, that's why this rule exists. 
just remember this child is always on the many side. And then you take it from the parent entity, you take the uh, primary key from the parent entity and insert it into the child entity. How would you go about choosing um, the parent child key? You might have already said this, but I, I, I probably missed it. Um, if both have a many side. Uh, we're just going to leave it for now. I'll leave your question unanswered for now. Uh, the only thing I will say is that you should avoid situations like that. You should not have a situation where you have a many-to-many -many relationship. Okay, cool. Thank you. And next class, we'll talk about how to avoid those situations, okay? Okay, so so that uh, that's the rule. Um, maybe something that will hopefully help you to remember that rule uh, uh, through mnemonics. Let me show you something like this. Let's say you have, uh, I'll delete this. Let's say you're building database for keeping track of uh, families, more specifically fathers and their children. Okay. So let's say we have a child name as the primary key. And then we're gonna have Father name. So I'm, I'm just simplifying things. I don't want to make it too complicated. So uh, at the minimum, one father is related to how many children? Many. At the minimum. One, one. Yeah, I would say one because it, like, it's probably not zero because if somebody has zero children, he, or she, he is not a father, right? Technically speaking. So minimum zero, what's the maximum? undefined really many right so once yeah. it's more than what's well, more than one we see many so it's one to many and if we're going this way one child is related at the minimum to how many fathers one yeah one Some, sometimes people say zero it doesn't make sense right the child has needs to have a biological father and if we're talking about biological fathers then uh, a child is associated with a minimum of zero uh, <laughs> zero at the minimum one fathers and what's the maximum One. It's like one and only one, right? So we need to find an appropriate cardinality here. Okay, so this is the cardinality. So in this relationship, which entity is a child entity? Child. Yeah, the child. So that will hopefully help you remember. So in that's, if that's the case, we take the primary key of the father and insert it here as a foreign key. By the way, maybe you cannot relate to this example as much as I do, because I told you that in my culture, your middle name is your father's name. So your father's first name, which is his primary identifier, is inserted in your name to, to signify, to show the relationship, right? Now, if you think about it, it's a good idea. Why don't, like, for example, why don't we do the opposite way? We take the name of the child and insert it into the name of the father. Uh, outside of databases for practical reason, why, reasons, why it's not a good, a good idea? What do you think? Doing it the opposite way. It would be completely retroactive. And, and what, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, you would have to have a kid to have a middle name. No, look, uh, I'm just explaining you like how it works in, in, in my culture, like in most Eastern European countries. Oh. <laughs> uh, when, when, when a child is born, right, then the child's middle name is his or her father's first name. Okay. So, for example, my uh, middle name is Alexandrovich because my uh, father's name is Alexander. Okay. So, father's name is inserted into the child's name. Okay. Now, why don't we do the opposite? Why don't we take my name and insert it into my father's name? So my father's name would be Vladislavovich because my first name is Vladislav. Why we don't do it the opposite way? What's the problem here? I mean, does it sound like a good idea to do that? Or, or what kind of problems, issues do you see? If we insert child's names into father's name, what's the problem here? just out of order it's, it's doesn't make any logical sense well uh i mean it, it makes logical sense look a child is born and the father gets the child's name inserted into his name right so i don't see like any kind of temporal <laughs> paradoxes here 
But what's the problem if we do it that way, the opposite way, not, not according to this ERD rule? I guess and, every, and, every time you'll have a child, your name, your name is just going to get longer? Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. Every time a father has a, has a, son, has a child, right, then his legal name will change every time they add this. So it doesn't make any sense, right? It's, it's much easier to insert father's name into the child name one time, right? And that will be like the legal name for life, something like that, right? So hopefully, I'm hoping that this example uh, will help you remember that rule, okay? Okay, friends, so with this example, uh, you have everything that you need to get started on uh, assignment three. And, and today we'll get started in the sense that I will explain to you uh, what needs to be done. And I'm hoping that uh, you will complete the first part of that assignment by our next lecture on Tuesday. You will identify all the entities and you will be able to, to at least sketch out the relationships because you will think more about those relationships later, right? And then after the Tuesday lecture, there will be another lab session. And in that lab session, we'll actually, we'll try to finalize our ERD models for assignment three. So let's go uh, to assignment three, if you don't mind, which uh, requires you to put everything that we have discussed to practice. So I'm pretty sure it says it is due on Sunday. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I need to think. Uh, I need to go through those. You know, it's not due. It will be due in two weeks. Okay, cool. So yeah, so I'll, I'll change. Maybe I'll let me change it right now so I don't forget. So and and that will be like uh, uh, a way to communicate when the deadline is. So it will be due not this Sunday, but uh, so we'll continue working. It will be next Sunday, twenty eighth. Okay. So I'll open this file right here. And I'm hoping that you will follow me. You'll open that file and you will see, you will follow the steps that I'm doing. Now the header is the same. Don't forget to put your section number, your name, your student ID, okay? Um, again, go over the instructions. They're the same as the instructions for your previous assignment. Uh, this is the executive summary. This assignment is based on the case found in, in Monk, uh, Monk's textbook. This is your course textbook in case you don't know. Uh, and this case is on page 11, okay? The case is under the heading practice database design problems. Your goal is to create a fully attributed normalized ERD model for the, uh, for the database that would support operations of the town library discussed in the case. Fully attributed means all the relevant attributes need to be there, including primary and foreign keys. Normalized, it's something that we're gonna talk about next class. We'll talk about normalization, okay? So today, uh, uh, today we'll get started, uh, we'll get started uh, on the first part. I'll, I'll show you how to do first part. And the second part, uh, I'm sorry, I think I should have deleted. It's not Glyphy, it's Draw IO. I mean, you, uh, you know, the thing is in the past I used Glyphy and I forgot to delete it here. Uh, Glyphy.com was, was used by me to create diagrams, but then they changed their licensing policies. It used to be a free tool. Now you have to subscribe and things like that. So I decided to go with Draw IO. So I'm sorry, I forgot to delete uh, uh, Glyphy.com and put Draw IO. And this is how I will catch people who don't attend lectures. Like if I see somebody trying to do it in Glyphy, uh, you know, I will know that they did not attend our lecture on Tuesday, right? On Thursday. Um, you know, actually one of one of my colleagues, it was Dr. Pilgrim. He told me that he already retired, so I can talk about it. He told me that on purpose, he would make a mistake in the assignment. And then he would explain that mistake in class to catch, uh, or, uh, to catch those students who don't attend classes, right? And I thought, well, maybe it's not a bad idea. Like this is what I will do too. Do you think it's too cruel? I mean, no, it's okay. I, I... I like it. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> well, anyways, so that's how I know who is not attending classes or paying attention. If I see them trying to do something with Glyphy, which is impossible, right? Because Glyphy is not available. It's not a free tool anymore. It means that some, you know, they, they did not attend or they attended, but they were playing video games while I was explaining which tool to use. Like, for example, several people told me, like, I don't know how to use uh, import IO for downloading data. And I explained to them that, well, I downloaded it for everybody because there were some problems with licensing again, right? So that's how I know that they did not listen or did not attend uh, that lecture. Well, anyways, sorry for, uh, for that digression. Uh, so yeah, it's Draw.io. I mean, you're welcome to use other, for example, you, I know some people like they're, uh, they're deep into database design. They're using some other diagramming tools. That's fine. You can use any tool you want. 
as long as I can understand what, what you have there. I'm okay if your uh, conventions are slightly different, right? So in the second step, uh, you, will, uh, you will create the diagram based on the entities that you identified, right? Um, but we'll, we'll get started on the first part today. Again, I'm hoping that uh, you'll complete the first part and you'll create a sketch of an ERD diagram by next class. Don't worry if something doesn't make sense, just give it a shot, create an ERD diagram, because I'm sure there will be some questions and those questions, a lot of those questions will be addressed by our class on Tuesday. But again, in order for you to understand more uh, where we're coming from with our next lecture, it, it will be good if you actually try to create an ERD di diagram on your own. Again, don't worry if it doesn't make sense, if there are some areas that are kind of nonsensical, uh, we'll figure out the details. And again, next Thursday, I will, I'm hoping everybody will join us. I'm hoping it will be in a real lab. Uh, if you're not a face-to-face -face student, you can uh, join us in Zoom. And I'm, I'm hoping we can resolve uh, disagreements, uh, issues with, in relation to your ERD modeling model uh, by the end of next week. So, uh, so this is the first step. You need to read the case titled Practice Database Design Problem on page 11. Again, that's a hint for you that you need the textbook. As you read the case, try to identify the entities together with their attributes that you will need to have uh, for this type of a database. Capture each entity that you identified with the table. And here's we have, here we have like a template for, for uh, capturing information in relation to each of the entities that you identified, okay? So make sure you, you, you keep track of them by naming tables like table one, you will have entity name here. And then provide brief description. For example, you will say something like this entity stores information about students, something like that. Students who attend Murray State University. It doesn't have to be long, just make sure you give like a, a specific so that if I'm not sure like what's happening in the ERD diagram, I can go back to that entity dictionary that you create with the help of tables and, and clarify things for myself, okay? Uh, if you haven't bought the book, uh, it's bad, but uh, it's not a fatal flaw in the sense that I have a scan of that case for you. But again, you need to use this time to, to order the book because we'll be using it a lot for subsequent uh, assignments. So this is assignment three case. It's in a PDF format. So you see it here, right? Practice database design problem. Do you see it on the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, good, thank you. So look, uh, these nodes look like actually similar to nodes that syst systems analysts might have. For example, when they design a database, when they're working uh, on, on, on creating an information system, they will interview people about their data needs. They will ask them something. So tell me about your work. So what kind of data you're handling? What kind of forms you're handling? And they will take notes based on those answers. And based on those notes, you will be able to identify entities. This is the so-called entity discovery process. And we'll talk about it uh, uh, in a bit more detail later. Mm -hmm. So imagine that you're participating in that entity discovery process. And here are the notes that you have in front of you. So imagine you're working for, uh, for your town library, let's say Callaway uh, County Library. And this library wants to keep track of its uh, business uh, using a database. And you've been called to build a database. So you talk to town librarians, you review their old paper-based records, uh, you observe people using library for a few days, you take notes, and those are your notes, okay? So you read those notes one by one, and based on those notes, you should be able to figure out what kind of entities you need to have on your diagram and what will be the attributes of those entities. So we'll, we'll do uh, a couple of entities together. So let's say you read the first part of your notes. Any resident of the town can get a library card simply by asking for one. The library considers each card holder a member of the library, okay? Typically, uh, you know, a starting point would be looking for nouns, like important nouns in your notes. So what are the important nouns here that indicate that we need to create an entity for that noun? So what would be one entity based on that first part? Resident. Um, I would have, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I agree. So we need to keep track of residents, but uh, I'll be more specific. The library calls oh. those residents that are members of the library, they call them uh, members, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. So library members, okay? So, so this is what I will do. I will create an entity called, oh, let me copy it. I will create an entity called, uh, I think library member is a better name, uh, but let's call it member to keep things short. 
So, so this entity, and I will add description here. About residents that are members. Something like this, okay? Now let's think about attribute names and their attribute data type. Uh, people ask me sometimes like how many attributes we need to have. Well, try to have some, like I don't want you to be like uh, too exhaustive. Like I don't want you to put like every attribute that you can imagine. So maybe like, maybe I'll give you the following rule. Uh, make sure it has uh, like at least five attributes or something like that, right? So, so let's think about attribute name. So let's say we're gonna have uh, member last name and that, uh, sorry, member name. Well, actually before that, let's say, let, let's start with the primary key. Let's say we have member ID and that will be our primary key. And here they're asking for attribute data type. So go back to this table, please, where uh, attribute types are listed. So member ID would be, let's say, uh, number. I mean, I would be okay if it's number. Although I think in real life it's text because uh, a lot of organizations, they use alphanumeric strings to identify people. So it could be text. As long as it's not like a date or yes or no, I'm okay with that, right? So let's put like number, okay? Then we're gonna have another attribute called member name. Uh, I think this is a good convention. Uh, that, at least that's the convention that I'm using. Uh, each attribute, the name of each attribute starts with the name of the entity because you may have name an attribute called name associated with several entities. So how do you know it's the name of the member and not the name of the librarian, for example, right? Well, this is how you know because the first part is member. So that's why you know it's this attribute stores information about member's name. So member name will be text. And let's say it's a compound attribute that has first name. and then member last name. And all of these are text, okay? And then I'll just put one more, one more maybe uh, uh, because we need to have five. So let's say member date of birth, DOB stands for date of birth. And that would be the date data type, right? Okay. So let's say we're done. By the way, in reality, you, you may end up going back and forth. When you create your ERD diagram, you will probably discover that some attributes are missing. So you'll go back and maybe add some attributes. For example, you may add a foreign key attribute or you will think about another attribute that needs to be there. So it's okay, just create a sketch and later on you can update your uh, uh, entity dictionary represented with those tables. So that's one. So let's say we're done. I mean, uh, I think we need to have more attributes than that as we read the case, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll read. Uh, We'll read the case more and we'll identify additional attributes, but for now, let's just stop right there, okay? So let's go back to our notes. So which other entity do you see in that first part of your notes? Library. Look, uh, actually a lot of people do that. We don't really need to store information about libraries, right? Because we have only one library, okay? So unless you're talking about the library with many branches, then you may have like library locations as an entity, right? Oh, okay. So you, you, don't, create, you don't create an entity for something that is only in one instance. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't make much sense. Although uh, there can be a case where there are several libraries uh, under one umbrella. In that case, you will have an entity called library storing that information. Uh, you know, maybe somebody can argue that uh, he or she wants to make this database scalable in case we have other branches, we'll have like a table ready for it, but let's admit it. Let's make it simple. Let's not make it too complicated. So so this, somebody said the second entity is what? It'll be your card. Yeah, we need to store information about cards that we issue to members, right? So we'll create another table here and we'll number it to card. We'll call it card. And this entity stores stores information about cards cards issued to library. So, what kind of attributes do we need for cards? Let's say we need. I will start by saying that we need to have card ID as the primary key. Anything else? And that will be integer or number. What else do we need to store in relation to cards? The name on the card. 
yeah, card name. By the way, that will be different from uh, member name, right? Because uh, I know that happens at MSC all the time. People have like different legal names, different preferred names. So the name on the, on the card may be different than the actual legal name of a library member. So that makes sense to store it uh, as a separate attribute. So that would be text. Anything else? How about issue date, card issue date, right? Because we need to keep track when it was issued, when it expires, and that will be date, okay? Wouldn't you put the uh, member ID as well on the card? Um, you know, it's, it's a good point that the point that you're making, uh, if you're assuming that there's one card for every member, then there's a one-to-one -one relationship, right? Yeah. However, I think that's not, I mean, again, uh, you see like we're speculating here. You may be right, actually. You may be right for most libraries. Uh, I'm speculating here, but I'm making that assumption, right? I'm making that assumption that cards expire. So the library wants to keep track of multiple cards associated with a particular member. So in that case, you cannot use member ID as your card identification. You see what I'm saying? Because it's not yeah. a one-to-one -one relationship. It's a, it's a one-to-many relationship because... Uh, one uh, member can have many cards, okay? But, but I see what you're saying. What you're saying is, is like a good observation. We may have a situation where uh, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, meaning one member is associated with exactly one card and one card is associated with exactly one member. In that case, we can use member ID in both entities. In fact, it's one entity. We're just splitting it into two tables uh, 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 in accordance with the tidy data principle of Hadley Wickham. Well, actually, he, he was not the one who invented it, but one concept per table, right? So here we have a card table and here we have a student table okay so we have two entities now let's uh, let's build uh, an ERD diagram without specifying attribute all of the attributes we'll just do it quickly so here we're going to have a uh, member here we have card so here we have card uh, id as our primary key and here we have member id as our primary key so so you can start creating sketch in parallel to that. You know, use uh, draw IO to create a sketch. So a member is associated at the minimum with how many cards? Is it zero or one? One. Yeah, one, because if, if a member does not have a card, then technically he's not a member. So one, and at the maximum many, let's say we have several cards associated with that member that expired, right? And then if you're going this way, one card is associated at the minimum with how many members? At the minimum. It would be many. So one card has many members. At the, so you have like, I mean, imagine like a physical card and there are like oh, what, okay. five, five photos there. So minimum is what? One. Sword. Yeah, I would say one, right? Because card is and maximum a uh, card is issued to one member, and maximum is what? One. It's exactly one. So we have exactly one here, and we have one or many there. So we'll need this one, right? So one card is associated associated with exactly one member, while one member can have one or many cards, okay? Maybe some of those cards expired. If that's the case, the parent entity is, is which entity? Okay, let me rephrase it. Uh, uh, the child entity is which entity here? The, the card. Yeah, the card is on the many side. In that case, we take member ID and we insert it into the card entity as a foreign key. And that, so it's a foreign key right here. And then, you know, I'm skipping all those attributes that are, that are also part of those entities. And that would require you to go back here, right? And insert another row here. That will be member ID, it's a foreign key. And the type is number, okay? So please proceed in, in that fashion. So I'm hoping by next class, you can identify all the entities and create a sketch. Don't worry if it's not perfect but create a sketch of an ERD diagram. By the way, I showed you, you can always save that ERD diagram. Go, you can go to file, save as, just save it on your computer, right? Uh, anywhere you want, it will have this draw IO extension. And if you want to insert it into, into this uh, document file at the end, that's what you need to do. You need to insert that file at the very end right here. You will do this 
you go to file, uh, export as, and then select advanced. Uh, the reason I, I need advanced, make it a very high resolution file because if it's a high resolution file, then no matter how small it is, I can blow it up on my screen and I can grade it, I can put comments there. So put something like for width, I don't know, at least 2000. Okay, so it's a high resolution, maybe even 5,000 or 3,000, 4,000, okay? So it's a high resolution file. So you export it and then it says where to device. So you see it's a high resolution file. And even if your diagram is very small, I can always blow it up and I can look at details and I can put some great, uh, some markings there, okay? And then what you will do, you will insert it here in the end. You will go to uh, insert picture and then you will select that file, okay? All right, so start working on it, have a list of entities and create a sketch of an ERD diagram and we'll talk about some additional nuances next Tuesday. Okay, so uh, let me take attendance before we leave, if you don't mind. Other than that, we're almost done. Clifton. Here. Braden. Here. Nathan. Here. Devante. Here. Aaron David. Aaron David, not here. Jessica is here. Hope. Here. Sean is here. Yeah, I'm here. This is Aaron. I said here, by the way. Just okay, I'm sorry. Here. Sean Harrison is here. Tristan is here. Violet. I'm here. Mason is here. Ahmed. Not here. Okay, next section. Wesley. Here. Here. Aaron Haney. Aaron Haney, not here. Tucker is here. Janice is here. Jacob. Here. Caitlin. Janice, are you watching TV or something? Here. What about Caitlin? Caitlin, not here. Jason Reynolds. Here. Brendan. Here. Okay. Casey, here. Here. Okay, friends, thank you very much, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Please uh, do some work on assignment three prior to our lecture.